Today I'm going to demonstrate proper MCAT strategies for you to help make the passage and the question a little bit easier and teach you some pretty cool sciences along the way. We're going to be using the double AMC sample test, psych -Soch, passage number four for this. As I read through the passage, I'm just going to show you my thought process and I'll be demonstrating the strategies for you. And of course, I'll show you where to find those at the end of the video. But passage number four says Asperger's syndrome is an autistic spectrum disorder characterized by difficulties in social relationships, communication, and imagination. In contrast to autism, Asperger's syndrome is marked by intact language and cognitive abilities, an impairment central to both autism and Asperger's is a deficiency in attributing mental and emotional states to others and explaining and predicting behaviors based on these states. So they're just kind of explaining a little bit of Asperger's and autism spectrum disorder to us. Um, and if, you, if you're not super up with your basic sciences, then you may be a little nervous reading this thinking, oh crap, I, don't, I really don't know what that is. And that's okay, you're not supposed to. This is an example of the MCAT throwing sciences at you that you don't have to know. What I do want to take from that is that we are talking about autism spectrum disorder and Asperger's specifically and that it leads to a deficit in like social abilities. In a study designed to investigate the genetic component of the development of AS, okay, so we're looking at the genetics possibly. The emotional processing of a group of children who had siblings diagnosed with AS was compared to that of controls who had normally developing siblings. Um, so I'm just going to say we're including decreased social and decreased emotional intelligence because that seems like something that they revisited a couple times um, in the first paragraph and the second. So that's probably what's important here is the fact that there is a form or fashion of emotional intelligence. Um, they're using sibling studies, which is just a way to normalize for um, nature versus nurture. And that's something you'll see pretty commonly in psych So if they're using twin studies or sibling studies, if they're using twins, then they're probably trying to normalize for the genetic variability, right? Because they have the same DNA makeup. And if they're using sibling studies and they have different DNA makeups, but they have the same environment. So that kind of that kind of standardizes for nurture. Continuing on, it says the participants in the AS sibling group and those in the control group were matched in terms of age and sex. Again, this they're just trying to cover their basis on um, research methods, just trying to show you that it was good research. To assess emotional processing, again, emotions, the researchers used the eyes test, which involves looking at photographs of the eye region of a human face and choosing a word that best describes what the person in the photograph is feeling or thinking. You know, some people have like dead eyes when they smile. I guess this is kind of what they're trying to see. Can, can you tell whether or not somebody is smiling when they cover up um, their mouth? So this looks like they are using the eyes test to test this emotional intelligence. intelligence. High, high scores on this test indicate increased accuracy in emotional processing. And so you could take the time to write out increased eye score leads to increased emotional competence, but that was pretty obvious. It says the results showed that the control group was more accurate than the autism spectrum or I'm sorry, Asperger's sibling group on the eyes test. So it shows that there is a little bit of a genetic component here. Um, so I'll put a little check mark by that for funsies. Researchers have also been interested in the role of mirror neurons. Okay, so now we're getting a new basic science here. Mirror neurons, you should cover this in your MCAT prep. In the empathetic deficiency that characterizes Asperger's syndrome, findings suggest that mirror neurons are found both in humans and other primates, and they fire both when the individual is performing an action and when the individual is watching another perform the same action. Okay, so if I'm eating a bowl of cereal, my mirror neurons fire. If I watch somebody eat a bowl of cereal, my ne mirror neurons fire. Some studies have indicated that mirror neurons are active when people are processing emotional expressions, leading researchers to hypothesize that mirror neurons might play a crucial role in the development of empathy and understanding other people's internal states. So we watch other people express emotions and that allows us to feel them and learn to express them. And I guess, in the context of this passage, since they started with Asperger's syndrome, I'm assuming what they're saying is maybe it's possible that Asperger's syndrome or autism spectrum disorder is due to like a deficiency in, in mirror neurons or something. I'm not sure. Um, that would be a that would be a little bit of a leap, but I'm curious if that's where they're going. So let's jump into the questions and see if that's what they do. Number 17 says, based on the passage, the mental functioning of individuals with Asperger's syndrome is most compatible with which approach to intelligence? So I think this question is difficult for two reasons. The first is that you have to figure out what the author is classifying as intelligence based on the deficit that Asperger's syndrome patients experience. What deficit were they driving home? It was this emotional deficit, right? That's the one that they did the whole test for. Really what we're looking at here is which of these four 
is going to show that there are multiple types of intelligence with emotional intelligence being one of those. So that's how I would rephrase this question. So going through it, answer choice A, so Spearman's idea of general intelligence. This is just the idea that like you're smart or you're not smart. I, I don't like that because that doesn't show that we have many different types and that's what we're looking for. B says Gardner's idea of eight intelligences. Even if you don't know these four definitions, you should be able to kind of intuit them by their names. So Gardner's idea of eight intelligences, that means that there's multiple ones. So I'm going to leave that in as an answer choice. Um, C says Galton's idea of hereditary genius. I'm assuming that that's going to mean something along the lines of intelligence and genius is passed along as a biological trait. So that's probably the main theory behind that. And then D says Bidet's idea of mental age. And that sounds like a theory that would describe like cognition based on your age or maybe even one that would assign you an age based off of your cognition. I actually think that's closer to the right definition. So if we're looking at these, which of these seems to allow room for there to be multiple types of intelligence? And that would be B, Gardner's idea of eight intelligences. Now, obviously it's better if you just know those definitions, but I don't and you will inevitably run across questions on the MCAT that you just don't know the science behind it. And that's not an excuse to go light on your content review because theoretically you should know this, but you should be able to intuit answer choices even if you don't know the science. And that's that's just an example of how to do so. Number 18 says, if individuals with Asperger's syndrome have impaired mirror neuron functioning, this is most likely the result in a deficiency in which type of learning? Okay, so this is not the question I thought they were gonna ask about mirror neurons, but what they're saying is, how do mirror neurons allow us to learn? AKA, to simplify this question even further, you need to ask yourself and boil down what mirror neurons actually do. This is the idea of, I watch you eat cereal, my mirror neurons fire. Now I know how to eat cereal. What type of learning is watching somebody else perform a task so that I can now learn to do the task. A, operant conditioning. No, that's the idea of providing rewards or punishments generally, so maybe not A. B, classical conditioning. That's like Pavlov's dogs, so maybe not B. C is observational learning. That's when I watch somebody do something, I or observe them do it, and then I learn how to do that task. So I like C. And then D is latent learning, which is this idea of only being aware that you've learned something when you've been asked to produce it. For example, I used to ride the bus home from school every day and I learned where a lot of people lived and I didn't mean to do that. I was just trying to get home and play Mario, but I did learn that. And when asked, I can produce that knowledge. So that's what latent learning is. So I'll say maybe not to D, that's not observational learning. Um, which would be the correct answer here. Number 19 says, which element of the study limits the conclusion that genetic makeup plays a causal role on Asperger's syndrome? Causal is a strong word. So I'm looking for anything that can punch a hole in this theory that Asperger's syndrome is completely due to genetics. And, and usually what that looks like functionally is I'm looking for an additional variable that the researchers did not control for. Answer choice A says the participants in the study have varying levels of genetic relationships with individuals who have AS. No, they were all siblings, so maybe not A. B says the participants are siblings of individuals who have AS rather than individuals who themselves have AS. That makes no sense because if all your participants have AS, then all your participants would have AS. So B doesn't make sense. They're just kind of trying to confuse you with fancy wordplay. So maybe not B. C says the researchers do not control for possible differences between same sex versus opposite sex siblings in the AS sibling group. Well, that was actually in the passage that they did control for that. Remember, I kind of made a little bit of a deal about it here. So they did control for age and sex. So maybe not C. That only leaves us with D, but I'm still going to make sure that it's right. Because sometimes you'll get through all four of them, you'll rule out the first three, and you get to the last one, and you're like, oop, that's not right either. And you have to go back and start over at your question and make sure that you interpreted your question correctly. D says the participants in the autism spectrum sibling group likely share the same environment with individuals who have AS. Probably. I mean, if they're siblings, then they're probably sharing the same environment, unless there's like one sibling that is loved more than the other. There was like a Harry Potter situation, but I'm gonna assume that they lived in the same house and one of them was not in a cupboard. So I like answer choice D. That's gonna be the best one. That is an additional confounding variable because now they're sharing the same environment. So we don't know if it's nature or nurture. Do you see how this brings in a little bit of nurture? That's what they're going for there. 
And the last one says, which intervention designed to increase the emotional processing of children with Asperger's syndrome makes use of extrinsic motivators? Really fancy way for them to say, what is an extrinsic motivator? It's going to be something outside of yourself. You generally think of like material stuff that's going to motivate you to increase doing a behavior, continue doing a behavior. A says playing pleasant music while engaging the children in a task that requires recognizing emotional expressions. That is changing the environment, but it's not motivating them to continue. It's not motivating them to do better because it's there the whole time. So maybe not A. B says putting emotionally expressive faces on the toys that the children play with. That's just creepy. That's terrifying. I couldn't imagine having like a Lego with just somebody grinning on it. Ugh. But also, it's there the whole time. So it's kind of like A. You can rule out for the same reason. It's not, even though it is extrinsic, it's not something that's motivating them to do better and continue because it's there the whole time. So maybe not B. C says we'll give the children 10 minutes of playtime every time they correctly name an emotional expression. If you perform correctly, then we'll give you a reward, and that reward will be extrinsic, like you can go outside and play. So I like C. D says having the children play a memory game that requires matching emotional expressions with labels. You're not giving them anything extrinsic here. There really doesn't seem to be much of a, re of a reward for winning the game or participating properly. The only possible reward here would be that if the children win the game, then they might feel better inside. And that would be an intrinsic motivator. So maybe not D. And a good way to think of extrinsic versus intrinsic motivators is extrinsic is when you get paid at your job. Intrinsic is when you get told good job. So this is generally a feeling. It's something that happens inside. It's an intrinsic motivator that spurs you to keep going. This is something that you're given to spur you to keep going. You notice I use a lot of strategies here. I, I simplified the question stem every time I read it. I made a, this chart, which if you're not familiar with the flowchart method, you probably don't know what the heck it is. We have a strategies playlist explaining all of these. So if this is the first video you're watching or you just need a refresher on those strategies, make sure to go to that strategies playlist and check them out. I genuinely credit these strategies with my success on the MCAT and all the students that I've tutored. Thanks for watching the video. Hit that subscribe button if you feel like you learned something and I will see you in the next one.